Are you feeling anxious? Would it make you feel any better to know that, to a certain extent, this is exactly how our culture wants you to be? Awareness has come to be considered a self-evident good. Every day, if you open a newspaper or turn on the TV, you find celebratory stories about people who are raising awareness about this or that risk or social problem or new threat. No sooner do events hit the headlines that social media profiles alight with filters and flags demonstrating awareness of and concern for the current thing. Every year, I sift through student research proposals from well-meaning young people who justify their research on the grounds that they will raise awareness of some hitherto obscure peril. Yet, besides aware, we might use other words to describe the outlook that these activities demand. Be alert. Be vigilant. Be anxious. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, and there probably is a predisposition among some section of the population to be excessively anxious. But we also can't ignore the progressive expansion of relevant diagnostic criteria since the 1980s. Gradually, the boundaries between normal and pathological anxiety have become blurred, and illness categories have crept deeper and deeper into what were once normal experiences of everyday life. But it's not just that the boundaries between what is normal and what's not normal have become fuzzier. Instead, a permanent state of anxiety is itself positioned as a normal and even desirable attribute of the good person, the aware and turned on citizen. In other words, pathological anxiety is the normal response to a world characterized by what are supposed to be myriad and proliferating risks. So anxiety is not just a psychological phenomenon, it's also a social one. Obviously there are individual differences at play, but the huge increase in anxiety diagnoses tells us that there's something social going on here. We're not just getting better at diagnosing anxiety. Anxiety, in large part, is social in at least two ways. One, it's the outcome of certain changes in our society, and two, Anxiety is an invitation. You're supposed to be anxious. I'm going to look at the first one in a bit more detail in the Patreon section of this podcast with psychologist John Bunch, so make sure you check that out. But let's look in detail at the second one. Anxiety has become a powerful cultural invitation. A good person is, in our society, in some ways anxious. The virtues of anxiety are implicitly communicated across the media. Fittingly, this past May was Mental Health Awareness Month, overseeing an onslaught of news media stories and social media posts drawing attention to the precariousness of mental health. But it was also Action on Stroke Month, Skin Cancer Awareness Month, and National Teen Self-Esteem Month, depending on where you were. That's leaving out the dozens of awareness days and weeks dotted throughout the year, so that in addition to May being National Clean Air Month, we get Sun Awareness Week, in case we forget to worry about the quality of the air and the risk of skin cancer with every breath and ray of spring sunshine. Since their inception in the 1950s, awareness days have proliferated, with one review showing over 200 awareness days spread across the calendar, the majority appearing after 2005. Yet the authors of that review noted that this explosion occurred without evidence of effectiveness, nor even a clear sense of what effectivist might look like. Of course, part of the motivation isn't just awareness raising, but fundraising. Charities need to make money, and they can't get any money if you're not aware that they exist. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, often such initiatives are expressly justified and measured as successful on the basis of their ability to heighten individual perceptions of risk, whether or not this even leads to changing behaviors, and whether or not behavior is really the problem. Awareness and the ability to promote awareness in others makes us good. With so much energy spent on awareness raising, is it any wonder that the period since the 1950s has so often been dubbed the age of anxiety? Anxiety diagnoses rose by 1200% from 1980 to 2012, according to one report. These trends are received with bewilderment. Suggested causes range from clinicians just getting better at recognizing signs of anxiety in our society just being more open about mental ill health. Others suggest social media comparisons are to blame, that young people are being invited to jump on a hamster wheel of attention where they're baited to be better looking, thinner, or funnier, or to consume more of this or that. Social media influencers are blamed for young people's anxieties about body image and eating disorders. 
Yet, no one seems to consider that maybe the awareness campaigns around the horrors of childhood obesity and being overweight and sending letters home from schools explaining that apparently normal children are too fat might have anything to do with it. I know personally I have tried really, really hard to let my own daughter have a normal childhood where she doesn't really worry about what she's putting in her mouth. I provide her with healthy options, and I think that's pretty good. Let her have a little bit of innocence, but every time I send her to school, it's like it's their mission to raise awareness in her that food can make you fat. And I'm sure once she starts to worry about getting fat, they're gonna wonder, gosh, why is she so anxious? And that's the thing, while awareness raising undoubtedly does a lot of good in the world, it can also do a lot of harm. And I worry that a lot of awareness raisers don't reflect on the harm that they could be doing. Instead, they go on raising awareness. Even about anxiety, for instance. Apparently, one can never be too anxious about being anxious. But our age of anxiety is about a lot more than awareness raising days. Our entire relationship to risk has changed. For example, since the 1990s, sociologists have identified a rising tide of what they call health moralism, where analyses of risk function to moralize a huge range of behavior. As anthropologist Mary Douglas has put it, risk, danger, and sin have been reconnected in contemporary society so that riskiness is akin to sinfulness. Our societies are no longer ruled by religion in ways that they might have been in the past. Attitudes toward health have become like religions of old, and awareness of risk, a virtue of the pious. Another example is cultural norms around parenting, which tend to favor anxiety. Mothers are supposed to be aware of and protect against any and all risks that might befall their children, even before birth. So expectant mothers routinely stress about the harms that might be caused by absent-mindedly eating a soft ice cream or minuscule amounts of alcohol found in baking. Social media posts warn mothers to beware of allowing teen daughters to attend nightclubs lest they fall victim to injection spiking, something I've talked about on another podcast, or to protect their young children from human traffickers supposedly lurking in changing rooms waiting to pounce. When shared on social media, many of these posts carry the hallmarks of urban legends that is, occupying the realm of the could be true. But the value of virtue on social media means that sharing these posts becomes a virtue in and of itself. Who cares if it might not be true? It could be true. And being aware of the risk is definitely better than not being aware of it. Who knows, it could happen. Better safe than sorry. The outcome of all this endless communication of risk in society isn't that we should deal with the risks and then worry less. The message is that anything can happen at any time. The fear is supposed to be ever-present. Remember what I said? Better safe than sorry. And there are a huge range of things that you should be thinking about to be safe from, lest you be sorry. What's more, often the message is that you're not supposed to cope. You're kind of supposed to become ill. It's not only that you're invited to feel like being anxious makes you aware and therefore good, but you're also invited to be aware of the huge range of illness labels on offer and seek help and support. While this is undoubtedly helpful for a lot of people, there's a tendency for awareness raisers to tell you that you should take your feelings and your uncertainty and your symptoms to a professional. Ironically, in some cases, this can make things worse because you can't be expected to cope within your own networks. And what happens if you can't access a professional? Since you're not expected to cope on your own and seeking help from non-professionals is portrayed as risky, you're kind of stuck. What I'm trying to get at here is that cultural virtues and pathologies, weirdly, are often intertwined. Sometimes what is being promoted is precisely that which one pretends to cure. So as I described in my book, Semiotics of Happiness, the happiness movement that reached its height in the late 2000s was less about celebrating the lighter side of life than it was about raising awareness of happiness as something really quite difficult. As I argued there, happiness wasn't being promoted so much as a sense of deficit was being normalized. Some diagnoses that gain in popularity actually mirror our peculiar cultural neuroses. Christopher Lash's famous culture of narcissism makes this point really well. Every society reproduces its culture, its norms, its underlying assumptions, its modes of organizing experience in the individual in the form of personality. As Durkheim said, personality is the individual socialized. It's not just young people that are feeling anxious in social situations, our whole society is experiencing a crisis. Lash describes the world of post-war America as one in which a narcissistic personality was actually encouraged. 
having no hope of improving their lives in ways that matter, he wrote. People turn to psychic self-improvement, becoming preoccupied with feelings and getting in touch with themselves. Last chastised therapies of the time for intensifying the diseases they claim to treat, celebrating, for instance, the disintegration of relationships as offering new opportunities for self-assertion and self-actualization. Yet while Lash correctly diagnoses the neuroses of an age, he doesn't dwell on why. If narcissism, or anxiety in our case, has become a social norm, how could society also identify it as an illness? It's easy to imagine that if anxiety is being pathologized, the social norm would be that we should all be calm and collected. But that's not actually how it works. Krishnamurti's now cliched line that it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society has acquired the air of a truism. Pathology is the normal and expected outcome of a risk society. Or, as a student once told me, it's like, if there's nothing wrong with you, what's wrong with you? The injunction is not that you shouldn't be anxious, but that you should be anxious, and you should label this anxiety as a pathology. It's a bizarre situation to be in. One way around the blurring of divides between normal and abnormal is the oft-repeated phrase that symptoms should not be so severe that they interfere with daily life. Yet, concept creep, which I've described in another video, continually lowers the bar for what is considered pathological progressively encompassing more and more of daily life. On top of that, the purpose of awareness raising is often expressly to encourage fear to the extent that it disrupts daily life. The obvious example is the COVID-19 pandemic, where the UK government specifically identified insufficient fear as a problem. A state of anxiety, such that one feels compelled not to leave the house, was an expressly desirable outcome. Yet still, this heightened fear was identified as a mental health problem. It's tempting to believe that today's risks have become so great that no normal human should be expected to cope. We've got climate change, Donald Trump threatening to be in office again, but we actually once lived in a world where death lurked behind every corner, and yet we feared it so much less. What's happened is not necessarily that we live in a more dangerous world, it's that we have a cultural narrative of human action in which human beings are far less capable of dealing with the risks that face us. There are just too many of them. They're too complex, too unpredictable for humans ever to completely make sense of, much less solve. We can only be aware and fearful. Label this fear, accept it, and seek help from the appropriate sources so you can learn to cope with this ever-present anxiety. In our society, Solving a problem is no longer as much a moral virtue as admitting a problem. The imperative is to be anxious. The valorization of awareness produces the edge of anxiety, where anxiety can be seen as both a virtue and an illness. Critics of the medicalization of everyday life often say, that's not an illness, that's normal. But what they fail to realize is that we are long past that. Illness has become a normal outcome of an allegedly sick society that offers few systemic cures. Awareness can lead to action, but often it leads to helplessness and a permanent state of anxiety. And maybe that's precisely the point. 